So that Jesus um, recapitulates. He tells the story over again of what? Of Israel. Particularly focusing on, on uh, Moses. Okay, what do we learn about the Beatitudes? That they reveal God's heart. What, what does God value? That God values the people that are mentioned blessed in that... Um, and that, uh, uh, what did we learn about the antitheses? Antitheses. What did we learn about? You have heard it said, blank. But I say to you, what did we learn about those? They were more required more than even the original. That's right. They they weren't they weren't opposites like sometimes the church has taught. They weren't. They're not really antitheses, but they are a um, a refocusing or a radicalization of the original Ten Commandments. So murder moves to anger. Adultery to lust, it's, it's, everything goes back to the root of, um, of the issue. Anything else? Uh, the natural consequence of justice goes into mercy. Yeah. yeah. And it actually ends up with mercy. Also. Yeah, that, that justice and mercy are not opposites. But mercy is an extension of where justice was going, right? So, so justice is great, um, but mercy is better, right? And so all of the justice laws in the Old Testament or in the New Testament, they really are all aiming towards that same goal, mercy. And so when Jesus is asking about a higher righteousness, um, I think a better translation of the word righteousness throughout all this text is mercy. He's asking for a higher, or as justice, he's asking for a higher justice, which is, which is mercy, the kind of justice that we would want to receive. And that's going to fall right into where we are um, in, our, um, in our text today. So go ahead and switch over to Matthew chapter 6. Um, well, last week we learned about all these uh, piety practices, and we move um, we move right into um, to Jesus' teaching about um, money. This is always an interesting thing because uh, Jesus spends more of his time teaching about money than anything else. I mean, it's it's like eleven to one. Um, he talks more about money than heaven. He talks more about money than anything else. Uh, why do you think that might be the case? The root of all evil? Yeah, the love of money is the root of all evil. Yeah, why else, what else might, might, why else might money make up the majority of Jesus' teaching? Because too often money rules our hearts and our souls. <laughs> yeah. That's right. I think that money is a, um, well, it is, it shows us what we value. And what we value, well, that's worship. So the, the word worship in English comes from an old, old English word, worth script, ascribing worth. So the word worship is an economic term. And so to be a, a worshiper of Jesus, to be a worshiper of the triune God, um, is an e economic thing. And so uh, I think that's why Jesus says, well, uh, there's a great prayer, you know, when, um, well, we let the acolytes do it, but generally at a lot of Methodist churches or on communion Sunday, I'll lift up the plates before the altar. Um, there's a prayer that some Methodist preachers pray, Lord, no matter what we say or do, this is what we think of you. <laughs> But I don't say it. I don't say it. But it's, it's got a strong point, right? That, um, that it's you know, really easy to talk about what you value, uh, but it's another thing to actually value it. And so I think that's why the majority of Jesus' teachings are economic in nature, because the economy, well, what does the word economy mean? Um, it means it comes from the Greek word orkos, meaning house, and nomas, meaning law. So economy is how we structure our community, how we structure our house. And Jesus is very interested in, in that. Economy is not, is not about money. Economy is about, about relationships and community. And so that's why um, the, the vast majority of Jesus' teaching is economic. 
And, uh, but it's still a great surprise, even after studying the scripture this long, I still can't believe how much Jesus puts weight on these economic teachings. <clears throat> so here we are, concerning treasure. Do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth, where moth and rust consume, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where neither moth nor rust consumes, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So there we have a, um, a really great teaching. I mean, it kind of starts off with, um, you know, um, any financial planner can give you these kind of same advice. You know, make long-term investments. You know, don't just, don't, don't just be a day trader, but make investments that last. But then it kind of turns on its head and is a call to completely reorient one's life around the coming kingdom. So it's, it's a call to have a different horizon. My financial planner is always asking about my horizon. What does that mean? Yeah. Yeah, like, like when do you think you're going to need all this money? When do you plan on retiring? And at this point, I, I don't plan on retiring. I mean, uh, you, you're supposed to pick a date. But I don't pick dates, you know. Um, the horizon is when you want to see that money. So our church investor says, you know, like the building fund. What, what is the horizon on the building fund? Boy, I would love to know that answer. <laughs> but because the horizon is coming, he's invested in safer and safer things. So that there, there's very little risk in the building fund right now because we're hoping to spend it on a building that's not yet built. Um, so, but if you have a more long-term horizon, well then, then what do you invest in? More risky things, right? If you're, if, you're best in your, if you're investing in your retirement fund, well, at my age, you're supposed to be all in, in really kind of more risky things. I mean, not blue chips necessarily, but stocks and mutual funds, um, international portfolios, uh, things that are more <clears throat> future-oriented. I think that... Um, you can tell a lot about a church by the way that it thinks about investing. So, um, a church made up of people who aren't thinking a whole lot about the future, well, their, their chief things to do are what? Yeah, I mean, um, we, we got this campaign to bring down the debt, right? We got this campaign... You can go through and look at the, the list of churches and what they're doing economically, and you'll notice that the majority of churches in our conference are making their plans for retirement. Because their, their members are, are retiring, and the majority of those churches are led by people that are about to retire, and they're making plans for their church to retire and die. That, you know, they're, 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 thinking about, they're thinking about how to get their affairs in order, and, um, and they're, they've moved from risky things to things that aren't risky. They move from risk to safety, and they're making their, they're making their last plans as a church. And, that, and guess what happens to those churches? Like the high, yeah, it happens. Uh, but other churches, and I think ours is one that is um, attempting and trying to live into this, are investing in the future. And, um, and that involves risk, right? It involves a lot of risk, but, um, you know, this... The building, but also the ministries of our church are growth oriented. And so um, the, the kind of questions that we ask about our portfolio, if we ask them at all, are the same kind of questions that we ask about our spirituality. Uh, are we investing in a way that's safe, where we get to hold on to all we got, where we get our affairs in order and, um, and check out, or are we investing in God's future? And the Sermon on the Mount wants us to in invest in the long, long haul, in the coming kingdom of God. And that these short-term investments dealing with monetary things, um, property, all of that path is passing away. But the kingdom of God is, is coming, the kingdom of God is coming forever. So I think this, uh, this teaching in particular really helps us think about the horizon. And our horizons are all too short. The horizon is God's coming kingdom. I love the story about St. Lawrence. The Catholic church up in Miwahitchka is called St. Lawrence Catholic Church. It was actually, it 
It's been closed um, in the last couple of years, and they hope to reopen it one day. Um, but St. Lawrence was a, um, a Roman martyr who had a church going. I told you the story maybe once in a sermon. And the Roman government was persecuting Christians, and, uh, but, but the Christian church kept prospering, and prospering meant um, more people, and more people meant more money and more buildings. And guess what? The Rome thought, wouldn't it be wonderful if we had those people and buildings and money? And so they began to seize property from churches. And they wanted the, the church's great treasury. Uh, St. Lawrence had built up a great treasury at the church. And he had three days of warning before Rome was coming to seize his church. And, and so what he did is he took that treasury and he invited in all the poor and all the lame and he took care of them. He, he bought all kinds of food. He brought all kinds of clothing. And he, he brought in the lame. He brought in um, the he brought in the blind and all the people from the margins of society. And when the uh, Roman prefect came and knocked on the door, he said, show me the church's treasure. And he said, here they are. Here they are. Here's our church's treasure right here. Uh, that, I think, is how to invest in God's kingdom. This is a really poor uh, earthly dividend, right? <laughs> um, but, but it's a great way of showing us where that... Um, where the St. Lawrence is focused on the broad horizon, he knew that it would have him killed. Of course, Rome had him executed there. They actually grilled him. They put him on on, on iron on an iron grill, and um, and of course the uh, story goes that as he was uh, being martyred, he screamed out, "This side's done. Flip me over." <laughs> Done, flip me over, and it was a way of saying, it was a way of saying to Rome in a humorous way, because the best way that sometimes the best way that you can critique power is through humor, and it was a way of telling Rome, hey, I mean, you can kill me, but I'm not dead. You can kill me, I'm not dead. I got a longer horizon. You might come and take this church, but you're not going to get our treasure because our treasure is this, the kingdom of God with the poor are brought in, or the hungry are fed. This is our, this is the kingdom. And so Lawrence, you know, he showed that, that um, higher horizon than most of us are able to see. Any thoughts or questions about treasure? Concerning treasure? We'll move on to the next pericope. The eye, oh, yeah, the eye of the, I can't read. The eye is the lamp of the body, so if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light is in if if then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. So this um this little um section is kind of unusual because it's put right here in the middle of the money teaching. And um, we have a little bit of a hard time figuring out what it means. Um, to, we normally think of the eye as a window to the soul, where people can see inside. But the, um, the Greeks and, uh, and the Jews, Egyptians, ancient Near East, they saw the eye as something that you didn't look into, but, but you looked out of, and, and that it, it shone a spiritual light. Um, shining out of it. So what, what this saying is really about is about what your intentions are. It has really nothing to do with eyes or any of that kind of stuff. It's about, you know, what, what's in your heart. If what's in your heart is light shining out, well, that's great. But if, if the light in your body, if the light coming from you is darkness, then um, you're really in a mess in the dark world. That, that seems to be um, the edge of what Jesus is doing. Uh, but it's a very strong statement, and I think sometimes, um, well, a lot of the light that we shine <coughs> is really darkness, and, and that does get us into more trouble than we even had before we uh, ventured out into the night. Let's move on to the next one. We're back on the money for a moment. And uh, no one can serve two masters. 
For a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Does anybody have another word than wealth? Okay, anybody have an, another word than money? Yeah. Mammon! Yeah, you can't serve God and mammon. This is good stuff. Uh, mammon is an Aramaic word. An Aramaic word. Which Aramaic is the language that Jesus spoke. Right? So whenever we have an Aramaic text, I mean, we, we just, an Aramaic word come through, it just makes us feel extra close to Jesus because we're now hearing it in, in the way that we're hearing something that's coming straight from the mouth of Jesus, the very word that he would have said, mammon. You cannot serve God and mammon. Sometimes um, you, we'll hear, well, mammon is like a god or a pagan god. No, it's just the, it's the Aramaic word for property. Not for any kind of property, not like soil necessarily, but it includes anything that, you, that can be owned. You can't serve God and stuff, would be another good way to translate it. You can't serve God and stuff. We have a lot of stuff, do we not? And spend a lot of time serving it. So, um, so he kind of, Jesus sets it apart as two masters. There's God and there's all this stuff. Do we own the stuff or does this stuff own us? Right? And, um, and so he's, he's saying that you can't really serve both ones. Um, the phrase here, hate the one and love the other, this is, I think, meant to be translated in the Hebrew or Aramaic way of doing it. Hate and, and love here is not an emotion. We're, we're, what we're talking about here is love. When, when uh, the scripture says, Jacob I have loved and Esau I have hated, that does not mean that God hated Esau. That's not what the word hated means in, in Hebrew. It means one's chosen and one's not chosen. There, there's no... Um, there's no um, emotion um, in the word, if that makes any sense. So, you either, you choose one, or you choose the other, and uh, you can't do both. This is a really wise saying, isn't it? This is uh, a, um, a wisdom teaching. In fact, um, I think the whole Sermon on the Mount really fits into the, um, the framework of wisdom like Proverbs, or Psalms, or Ecclesiastes. These are wisdom teaching about uh, what is, what's really valuable in the world. Any other thoughts on this section before we get to the next one? Well, this one is, the next one is one that we really, really like. <laughs> don't worry, don't worry about a ting, right? Every little ting is gonna be all right. <laughs> Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or what you will drink, or about your body, what you wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Okay, so now, how does this relate to the rest of the Sermon on the Mount? Okay, so often we go to this text and we think, well, Jesus is telling us to not worry about things which is not really the case. I think he's telling us to really worry about one thing. Right? So we, the whole idea is not to not worry at all. It's not to worry about the stupid stuff that doesn't matter. It's about worrying about one other thing, which is the kingdom of God. Don't worry about your life. The, the king, the, there's a horizon that's coming, and that horizon is something that we really ought to worry about. You guys are worrying about the wrong thing. Don't worry about how much money you got, what your clothes look like. Don't worry about what you're eating. There is a kingdom that's coming. Worry about who's out there that's not getting anything to eat. Worry about the hungry. Worry about the, the, the poor in spirit. Worry about the persecuted. Worry about the oppressed. Um, worry about the kingdom that's coming, not your own short-term um, horizon. Let's move on a little bit here. Look! At the birds of the air, they neither sow nor weep nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? Um, first of all, I think we can notice here that Jesus is teaching us something about creation. What is he teaching us about creation? <clears throat> yeah, 
that God cares for it. I mean, that God cares for even the smallest of creatures. That, that Christians are a people that worry about about creation. I was talking to Dusty today about the bay. And, uh, you know, he, he worries about the water quality. And that is a Christian thing to worry about because God cares about those creatures like he cares about us. And so I think that's kind of cool to notice. And then um, it kind of moves on to, you know, our, our own value. If God cares about every fish in the sea and all the birds in the sky, I mean, just imagine how much God cares about you. This is that song, His Eyes on the Sparrow. His eye is on the sparrow, so I know he watches me. Yeah, I know he watches over me. Yeah. And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? When white sit in the lilies of their toil, nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow, is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so here we have the comparison about the birds and the, and the fields and, um, and clothing, about God's own um, care for us. And this is a very personal picture of a God who's very involved in our everyday life, right? Not a God that's very distant, but a God that's watching over and caring for everything that we are doing. Um, I love this view of little faith. Um, the Greek is oligopistoi, which means the little faith ones. And Jesus begins to use this term. This is its first occurrence in Matthew's Gospel. But he begins to use it a lot. And um, it becomes a term of endearment. You little faith ones. So there's, there's a... Um, a loving nature to this. And the, the term little faith ones, uh, well, first of all, it says that we've got faith, right? We've got it, but ain't much of it, right? We got it, but it ain't much of it. And then how does the parable on the mustard seed fit in with this? If you have just a little bit, well, it's enough. So that's, so all these teachings pull together this, the, the, we little faith ones, we got enough of it. And that's, that's where Jesus is, is heading with this. Our little, our little faith is going to be enough to get us where we need to be. So where are we now? What are we where? Yeah, therefore do not worry saying, what will we eat? Does anybody wake up thinking about what will we eat? That's the first question we asked after breakfast at our house. You know, what's for lunch? <laughs> what we will drink, what we will wear, who takes a little while picking out their clothes in the morning. I'm not calling any names. For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things, and indeed your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. So now he tells us what we will and ought to worry about. What should we strive for? But strive first for the kingdom of God and His righteousness. What's a better word for righteousness? Justice. Strive first for His righteousness, justice, and all these things will be given unto you. Set your horizon on the coming kingdom of God. The, that kingdom, we learn its shape in the Beatitudes and in the Antitheses. We learn what it looks like. Set your sight on that, and everything else will be just fine. Yeah. Uh huh. Verse 32, what he's saying? Gentile. Yeah. Why? Yeah. I mean, in this particular version, you know, the Greeks are pagans. Yeah, the, the, um, the Greek word is ethnos, meaning, what well, we use the word ethnos, ethnicity, it means nations. And so at this point, the word nations in, um, in the New Testament in particular is really about the way the Greeks and Romans or of the world, and in the Greek and Roman world, um, what wins the day? Power. Power, power money, sex. These are the great things, right? And uh, and in the Greek and Roman world, that's what's really valuable. It's winning, 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 and um, power, the sword. And, um, and so that's... Um, 
collecting, collecting food that's powerful, the clothes that you wear, and so you have this real um, kind of back and forth between God's little ones um, the, and the church and the, and the nations, the ethnos, which um, the, uh, the Jews only consider there to be two kinds of people. There are Jews, and then there's the ethnos, the others, the, um, the Greeks. The, the, it's like when you go to Amish country, you know, have you ever been to Amish country? There's only two kinds of people there. There's us, the Amish people, and there's the English. You can tell them, well, I ain't English. They, they, don't, they, they don't believe you. You're English. You know, that's all there is. And so um, this, is, this is everybody else, but it's particularly the Greeks and Romans who have the same strategy. Might makes right. Power, 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 power over others. And the gospel is the exact opposite, where power oppresses the, um, the kingdom of heaven is the opposite. It's liberating where there is not rule over, over people. That's a really great, great uh, thing to lift out. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. Can I get an amen? Yeah. Yes. Man, has it been one of those days for you? Woo! It has for me. <laughs> Tomorrow is a new day. Yeah. All right. I, I can't read this without being convicted every time how superficial my concerns are from day to day. Because day to day, this is where my life is. I, you know, I think about, you know, I use my Bible study, I, I pray, but the vast majority of my time is what am I going to eat, what am I going to wear, what am I going to do? How much money is left in the bank? Superficial things. Yeah. It's very convicting. I think it is. I think it is. Um, that we worry about things that don't matter. Things that we have no control over. I love that. The AA serenity prayer. You know, God grant me this serenity to... I don't know. <laughs> Does anybody remember it? To change the things that I can change and the things that I can't change to just let them go. That's basically it. And the wisdom of the difference, and just to let things go. And so, um, yeah, I think that's right. I also think that this don't worry stuff is still focused on the kingdom, which is focused on caring for others, particularly the lowly. And so it's another way of saying, don't worry so much about your own self and your own stuff, but think about the kingdom, which is your neighbor. And that's where this sermon is going. So think not, not yourself, but think about your neighbor, particularly in need. Yeah, Chuck. This, this, he's just saying the attitude to a different way. Right? This goes along so well. He taught us that the attitude to turning the world upside down. That's what this is. That's right. That that true power isn't coming in and taking over your country. It's it, true power is is feeding the poor, ser serving those in need, um, the the lowly. And I think I think that this text. Some, for some reason, well, we love this text because we really need to hear it about not worrying, but we tend to cut it out of its place uh, in the Sermon on the Mount and, uh, and, and tend to make it about us instead of about the shape of the kingdom that is coming. And then we don't use this one. Verse, chapter 7, verse 1. Do not judge. <laughs> yep, we don't memorize this one. So that you may not be judged. For with the judgment you make, you will be judged. And the measure you give will be the measure you get. Ooh. I wish he hadn't have said this. Yes, yeah, so um, we have some, um, well, th there's some other warnings in Scripture about judging. And we can find them in other ancient texts, but this is the only place we can find an absolute. What are the, what are the word I use here? I use absolute prohibition. Absolute prohibition of judging. Wow. Absolute prohibition. And, um, yeah, the word judge. Let's think about that for a second. My print's too small. I can't read it. Here we go. Judge. Crino. Crino. It means to be critical. Uh oh. Be careful. And it means to condemn. So, um, boy, I, I feel like sometimes I can do pretty good about not condemning, 
but I don't do all that good about not being critical. <laughs> so, um, so Jesus is warning us not be critical of others and condemn others, um, but to operate by higher righteousness, which is justice, the high, which is which is higher, which is mercy. Right. So instead of being critical of others and thinking the worst of them, um, to instead offer them an open hand. And to not to not judge, even when we are think they're in the wrong, to um, to not be critical of them and condemn them. And I think um, it gets a little more interesting here. Well, the measure you give will be the measure you get. Boy, that's hard stuff, huh? Let's not judge people then. But, Why? Hmm? But in, in other scripture, Jesus says you you can judge a tree by the fruit it produces. Yeah, so I think that um, we're kind of using the word in different ways here. So judging a tree by the fruit is kind of telling to see what kind of tree it is. Um, but it's not our place to criticize that tree or, um, or to condemn it. Um, it's, it's God's own place. And when we get to the trees that we're judging, the trees that we're judging is not somebody else. But it's us. Or it's, focused, it's focused on us. And so, um, but you're right. I think that there is, um, we have to make some judgments. But in our judgments, we shouldn't judge. Maybe, how does that make any sense? Yeah. But I think if you don't think about it, it does, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. I think to help us understand this, all we need to do is look at Jesus' life. He lived yeah, and um, we're, we're getting up to the golden rule. Sorry, I just spilled the beans, but you were supposed to have read it anyways, maybe. And so I think the whole idea is um, imagine yourself and the person's shoes that you're judging and treat them how you would want to be treated if you had done the same thing. And to me, um, that's the difference between making a judgment and judging. Um, judging is treating someone some way that they might deserve but you wouldn't want to do it to yourself. You wouldn't want to be treated that way. And so that's the kind of judgment that God wants us to make, this kind of kingdom justice, which is a higher, higher righteousness. How about that? Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eye? Wow. Or how can you say to your neighbor, let me take that speck out of your eye while the log is in your own eye? You hypocrites, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. Yeah, so that's back with where we start and, um, and seeing ourselves as not someone who is better than everybody else, um, but to see ourselves as a sinner just like everybody else and are in the same shoes as those people out there that... Maybe they're doing something that you disagree with or something that you view as bad, but to see yourself in their shoes and be treated and treat them in the same way that you would want to be treated if it was you in their same situation. I think that uh, we have, the problem with the log in our eye is that we kind of grow accustomed to seeing around it. We call that a blind spot, right? And our blind spots, um, you can easily pull out in front of a semi-truck, right? If they're in between where your mic rear is and this mirror here and the window you can see out of, that's your blind spot. And the blind spots can be really, really big. And the bigger the blind spot, the more you can't see. And the, the worse it makes you in the world. I mean, you're trying to tell other people how to drive. You can't see out your own windows. Um, and so this uh, kind of helps us with that. And, and I think that... So often, when we start talking about ethics and morality, we always start with how other people ought to be living. And uh, Jesus is basically telling us, no, no. You can't talk about a sin until you have experienced it and know forgiveness from it. You can't, you can't begin to, um, you, you can't act, there's no us and them. It's all us's or them's. Uh, yeah, it's all us's. There is, there, when, when we talk about judging and sin, there is no us's and them's. It, we're, we're all in this together. And Jesus and God are the only ones on their own. And, um, and we are all um, in this 
in this together. I love the story of Ignaz Schimmelweis. I've shared it with you before about a doctor who discovered germ theory. He, um, he, he realized that a bunch of his patients, he was a delivery, delivery doctor, um, OBGYN, and a bunch of the mothers died after childbirth. It was like a quarter, about a quarter of the mothers. And so his numbers, his numbers at his hospital were worse than all of Europe. He was in like Berlin, I think. And he was trying to figure out, well, I mean, what could, what could be wrong? And so he set up a bunch of different tests, and he, he tried different antiseptic wipes. He, um, he, he tried all these different variables on how to reduce the, um, the death rate at his hospital. Different nurses, different techniques, different tools. And, um, and guess what? That didn't change. And then he wore out, and he went on vacation. I think he went to, like, the French Riviera. And while he was out of town, guess what happened? None of the women died. <laughs> and so he realized that he was killing them, but he did not know how. And so he created this idea that there was a magical force that dead cadavers had on them, and that you could bring this magical force from the morgue to labor and delivery. Because every morning he would go down and he would deal in the morgue, and then every afternoon he would deliver babies upstairs. And so he believed that there was a magical spiritual force that one day somebody would solve. And, of course, this is germs, right? Germ theory. Uh, but I think that uh, most of us wouldn't have come to the realization that Ignatz did. I mean, he realized that he was the problem. And uh, most of us start with the problem out there. And in, in my limited experience, every problem that we have out there is really a problem right here. Whatever makes us angry, whatever is really bothering us, it's really something that is only right here. And, um, and it can only be treated right here. So that's that log in our own eye. Ignat Schimmelweis. It's a wonderful story. You can read about it on Wikipedia. Or there's a book called Leadership and Self-Deception. Ooh, that's a really great book. It's by... I don't know what press, but it's about him. Um, where are we now? Um, Profane and the holy. So now we're kind of getting into what seems like random stuff, but this is good. Do not give what is holy to the dogs, and do not throw your pearls before swine, or they will trample them underfoot and turn and maul you. Yep, so why is this right here in the middle of this sermon? But we don't really know. All we can guess is that Jesus is telling us not to be swine and dogs. You know, like, um, are you going to just listen to this stuff about the eye and the slog and then, like, keep going and doing regular stuff? Or are you going to actually try to get the log out of your own eye? Um, if you do what most of us do, well, then Jesus is just throwing his pearls among hogs and swine and dogs. And so I think that it kind of functions that way, um, that... Um, we need to be careful that the pearls thrown to us and, and, um, and maybe the pearls that we throw as well. Let's move on to verse 7. Ask and it will be given to you. Search and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. Everyone who asks receives. Everyone who searches finds. Everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for bread, will give you a stone? Or if your child asks for a fish, will give you a snake? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Yeah, so here we have some wonderful, um, more teaching about prayer. So in Hebrew scriptures and in, um, in Jewish theology, asking, seeking, and knocking, these are all prayer words. So Jesus is back to teaching on prayer, like the Lord's Prayer. And so all of these, all of these things kind of go back to that. Um, our fundamental ground for prayer is our relationship with God, our Father. And our Father, our God, wants to take care of us like He takes care of the birds and the lilies of the field and is going to give us um, good things when we continue to pray. Let's move on to the golden rule. This now it moves to what I think is the climax of the entire sermon. The climax and conclusion. In everything, do to others. So in everything, well that's like a lot, right? Everything. 
Um, it's almost like he's saying that yeah, this everything includes everything else in the sermon that we've already covered. In everything, in fasting, in praying, in giving alms, in the treasures, in all these things Jesus has just covered, in everything, so now this is the overarching principle that summarizes all the teaching before, and all of these things we've been teaching about, do to others as you would have them do to you. For this is the law and the prophets. So now, um, where have we heard about law and prophets in this sermon already? In the first chapter of the sermon, I come not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Right? So, this is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. Doing to others as we would have them um, do unto us. Um, at the same time, Rabbi Shammai and Hillel, who lived about the same time as St. Paul, um, just after Jesus, um, there's a story about how a uh, would-be disciple came up to um, Hillel and Shammai and said, Can you teach me the whole law and the prophets while I'm standing on one foot? And the teacher then smacked him. <laughs> That's what Martin Luther would have done. Yeah. I love it when the, the disciple asked Martin Luther, so before the creation of the world, what was God doing? And Martin Luther said, well, he was looking for a stick. And the disciple said, well, why was he looking for a stick? And Martin said, to smack people like you. <laughs> well, anyways, that's not what the rabbi said. The rabbi said, that it was basically, he gave him the golden, the, the golden rule, the same thing. Um, what is hateful to you, do not do to your neighbor. And so I think the fundamental teaching here of the golden rule is um, the ability to have mercy and empathize with other people in other situations. And that, that ability to see ourselves in their shoes, in, in, their, in their skin, and to offer the same kind of mercy that we would want for ourselves. This is what Christian ethics looks like. And I think it's kind of different than um, um, our, our country is built on enlightenment ethics, the Constitution, um, in philosophy we call them liberal ethics, where everybody gets a fair share of just, justice. John Rawls um, used a story about a birthday cake. This is, a, this is like American justice. Um, the person that cuts the cake um, is the person who gets the last slice, right? So, so uh, you have to go behind a, um, a veil of ignorance and decide up how it's going to be as if you don't know which slice you're going to get. And guess what? If you know that you're the last person to pick the slice of cake, how are you going to cut that cake? Evenly, right? So, so that, that's kind of what the American Enlightenment system is based on. That kind of evenness, which I think is really wonderful. That's really good stuff, right? I mean, I would want a nice piece of cake like everybody else. But I think the golden rule, like, well, th that whole idea of justice is sort of based on the golden rule, right? John Rawls' concept of democracy, that's based on the golden rule. But the golden rule is actually getting a little bit far, further along because if, it's like if you're cutting the cake and the person you're giving it to is you, what kind of cake would you want? You know, and so, <laughs> so I think that it puts the emphasis on not just justice, not just making all the pieces of cake evenly, but, but making sure everybody gets a full piece. Right, so it's not on everybody getting equal pieces, it's on people getting the full piece, as if the, the kind of piece you want. And so it's a little bit more proactive and, and love-based. And um, we could do that with a categorical comparative with Kant too, but we were out of time and I think it would be boring. <laughs> so the, the whole idea is that that's, this is how Christian politics, this is how Christian ethics are done. It's not about what we, what's good for me, myself, and I. It's about what's good for others. That's, that, is, that is the only question Christians ask when we, when we talk about politics and ethics, is what's good for somebody else, not, not what's good for me, myself, and I. And I think, of course, that's not the only question Christians ask. Most of the time, we go to the polls doing what's best for us, right? I mean, we, we are interested in only in how it treats me. 
Um, but, but Jesus wants us to think about a different way of doing ethics, where we worry about um, the kingdom people um, then and others, our neighbors, before we worry about ourselves. And I think that kind of summarizes what the whole Beatitudes is about. It brings it, brings it all together. We're going to go really, really fast with the rest of these. Are you ready? In and through the narrow gate, the gate is, is wide and the road is easy that leads to destruction. Um, for the gate is narrow and the road is hard that leads to life and there are few who find it. Jesus is saying this gospel way is really, really hard and nobody does it. Um, but it's the only way. So it's a warning. Beware of false prophet who come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by your fruits. There's that judgment section you're talking about. In the same way, every good tree bears fruit. And um, we're going to skip down to self-deception. This one is really rough. 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many of you will say to me, Lord, Lord, we, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many deeds of power in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Go away from me, you evildoers. This picks up in Matthew chapter 25 when he tells the judgment parable of the sheep and the goats. Who, who's in and who's out? It was the ones who did this for the least of these. That story directly connects to, um, to this shorter teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. Whoever's, the ones who do it for the least of these are the ones who are doing it for the kingdom that is mentioned in the Beatitudes. Um, so, um, being in the kingdom of heaven is not about proper theology and prayer. Lord, Lord, this is good theology. Good theology and it's really good prayer. Lord, Lord, that's a prayer. Nope, that's not enough. And doing awesome deeds of fireworks, miraculous healings, exorcisms, all that, fi all that fire power. Nope, that's not enough. All that's enough is doing the will of the Father. Another really hard one to handle. 24, we're at the very end here. Everyone who then hears these words of mine, we've got four minutes, we're doing fine, um, are like the wise man who built his house on a rock. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds beat on that house, but it did not fall, because it had not been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. So here we again have a reference to the horizon that is coming. The parable that Jesus tells is a one that um, ancient Near Eastern people would know because in the middle of, um, of every area is a really flat, sandy spot where everything's really nice and easy to build on. And then, then there's all these hills and rocks where it's really hard to build on. And you would just maybe want to sell in the flat sandy spot. But there's a problem in the desert. That sandy spot is called a wadi. A wadi. And a wadi is a river that only flows a couple of days a year. I mean, so it's really easy to mistake that wadi to be a nice place to live, to build a house, but it is not. During some parts of the year, it is a raging river, and your house will wash away. That's the easy place to build a house. The hard place to build a house is on the rock. You can't break it up real easy. It's all crooked. It's sloping down, but that's the place where the house will stay, and it's all about well, the flood that's coming. Right? The flood that's coming. I um, have read a ton of art articles about the Chinese and the dam they built at Three Gorges. It's just amazing. They flooded and they moved 1.7 million people from their homes by flooding this river valley and creating one of the world, it is the world's largest man-made lake. Uh, but they had to move, they had to move a city that had almost a million people in it. The whole city had to be moved. It would be like moving a couple of Tallahassees, <coughs> three Tallahassees. <laughs> they, they moved all this around, but a whole bunch of people did not want to move. The Chinese government was not worried about them. <laughs> they came and announced, 
hey, we put the dam in, the, as it rains, the water's rising, and, um, you know, you can check with the government and we'll build you a house over here in this, these new cities. But a lot of people didn't want to go. And guess what happened? The water came. <laughs> I think that Jesus is saying, the kingdom is coming, the water is rising, and where are you going to build your house? Are you going to build it on your treasures? Are you going to build it on temporary things? Your, the, the things that you eat, things that you drink, the things that are for you? Or are you going to invest in the kingdom that's for others, something that lasts for eternity, for love? And then on 20, verse 28, now when Jesus had finished saying these things, he dropped the mic. Right? <laughs> these, the crowds were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, ecousia, a great important word in uh, Matthew's Gospel, and not as their scribes. Jesus teaches with authority. Well, let us close in prayer. Almighty God, we confess that we really love ourselves, and we love our stuff, and we worry about it all the time about what we eat and drink and what we wear, about what we have and what we don't have and whether it will be enough. We tear down our barns, we build bigger barns. But you have called us to worry about your kingdom that is coming. A great baptismal flood that will wash over this world and create a new heaven and a new earth where the lowly are lifted up and the powerful are brought down where the full are sent away empty and the hungry are filled. Help us to be hungry, to hunger and thirst for justice. Help us to be your kingdom people, beatitude people, who see this world in a different way. Show us where we are building our homes on sandy ground. And help us to follow that narrow way and build our homes on your rock-solid kingdom. We pray this prayer in the name of Jesus.